I am Ruth Bavisset. I work for cPanel in Houston. I just recently joined them. That was in March. Oh, here comes Scott. Hi, Scott. <laughs> and uh, teammate Scott, taking one for the team and showing up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> steady, steady. <laughs> Before that, I worked in the library automation business. Um, I spent 20 years doing IT for libraries, mostly, and um, library automation is an interesting business. It doesn't matter if you're working for a for-profit company. Your customers have no money, so you're working for a nonprofit, <laughs> basically. So whatever you're doing now for the company you're doing with, chop $20,000 off of your salary, and that's basically what you would be paid to do what you're doing right now for libraries. It was, yeah. In my case, when I, when I went to CPanel, I got a 40% raise plus benefits that I'd never had before. So that was, you know, really cool. Um, yeah, so, and, and if that interests you, you know, we've got a booth downstairs and we're hiring like damn near everything. So do please. Yeah, and in the, and in the, in the yeah, thank you, Sarah. I've put in my mandatory plug. Now I can talk about really hard stuff, and that's people. You know, this technical stuff that we do is not that hard for us that do it. People think that what we do is all amazing and stuff, don't they? But what we do is really simple to us because it's what we're good at. The hard part of any software project has nothing whatever to do with technology. It is those flesh and blood people. Well, and the people are what makes communities the way they are. You know, all the flappery in the Pearl community in the last... 12 and a half months over codes of conduct and all that rot is not caused by Pearl. It's caused by people. <laughs> us. Us. All of us. Who have participated in the Pearl community now or in the past. In the past 25 years. Because we have made the community what it is. Today I'm going to be talking about the, the community that I know better than I know Pearl, which is the Koha Automation Community. It's an open source project for library automation. Um, mandatory cat picture. <laughs> this is my beanbag chair. You will be quiet and orderly. You will not throw books. If you prove yourself worthy, I will let you pet me, and I may even come sit on your lap. In the meantime, I am watching you. I'm watching you closely. So for those of us who are not familiar with what library automation is... Well, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm glad you asked, because my very next slide is, what is Koha? Well, Koha is an integrated library management system manages the collection, the patrons, the relationship between those things. If you borrow a book, when it is due, the rules under which you may borrow and for how long you may borrow, how much you're fined when you don't return it on time, if at all. Um, the library's purchasing budgets and acquisitions, how they manage their periodical subscriptions to make sure that they get all the issues that they have paid for in their subscriptions. All of that stuff is in an integrated library management system. And there are two very large open source projects that are extant in this country right now, and one of them is Koha, the other is Evergreen, which our friend over there works for. We won't throw rocks at the heathens. <laughs> <coughs> Koha is an older software. It was developed to solve the Y2K problem. It was a rural library district in New Zealand, the Hora Finya Library Trust. Um, they still have the same director, and she's a sweetheart, but she realized her software would break. And so she contracted a web services company to build a new ILS. Well, they didn't know much about libraries. But over time, as they open sourced this thing, more librarians and more techie people who worked with libraries came on board, and Koha has developed and is now fairly standards compliant, fairly widely used for small to medium-sized libraries. Um, I have dealt with libraries of a million, million and a half volumes, 700,000 patrons, and Koha handles them just fine. It is a fairly fundamental LAMP application. Linux, Apache, MySQL, Perl. Uh, multiple companies around the world are providing support, hosting, and migrations for it. I've worked for three of them here in the United States. Let's talk about the community from which Koha sprung. Because that gives you some insight into the problem that Koha solves, and therefore its need for existence. Um, librarians and librarians generally, well, you need a, there's a caveat to that. Statistics about diversity gaps in libraries really don't make a lot of sense. 
Because libraries, there's stratification in libraries. Public libraries are different from school libraries, which are different from college and university libraries, which are different from law libraries or corporate libraries, which we call special libraries. And so librarianship in K-12 education, in, in children's education, is much more heavily women than in colleges or in public libraries or in law libraries. It, so it, it varies, in, and there's a lot more to it than just how many men, how many women, okay? Libraries are overwhelmingly female, professionals. Okay, there's another piece. A professional librarian has a master's degree in library science, period. If they don't, they're not a librarian. That term is reserved for somebody who has a master's degree. And some librarians are particularly fussy about that distinction. And they will bite your nose off and feed it to you for lunch over the matter. Over there laugh people who have had their noses fed to them in such a way by making the mistake of calling a paraprofessional a librarian and watching the librarian go, <laughs> which they do. I do, that when, I do that with librarians in the room, and they go, yeah, so? <laughs> yeah. All right. So again, there's another piece of the distinction. More men are paraprofessionals, percentage-wise, than librarians. More librarians are women. But here's the kicker. Director's offices are 60% male. Why is that? Well, let's blame this guy. No fair. You know who this is. No fair. People who work in libraries. Anybody know who this is? No fair, Adam. I told you earlier. <laughs> Melville Dewey. He's the guy who came up with the Dewey Decimal System that is used in most public and school libraries here in America. Melville Dewey was a professor at Columbia College, what's now Columbia University, in 1874 when they decided to start admitting women to the Library Science Master's Degree program. And he was a huge supporter of this. He said, this is great. We need more women librarians. At that time, public libraries were just catching on in this country. Remember, the first public library in the world was in this country. Free public library. It was Boston. Yay, Boston. Yeah! <laughs> so public libraries were still a new thing. And we needed lots of librarians. Plus, public education was catching on. And we needed librarians in the schools. And Melville Dewey said, we need more librarians. We've got to admit women. I think this is fantastic. We need more women so that the men can stick to the important work of leading libraries. Double standard? You betcha. But he's not totally to blame. He wasn't the only professor of library science at Columbia College at that time. Structurally, the industry, like many others, was male-dominated. Leadership was in the hands of men. How many chiefs of staffs of major hospitals are men? It's true in a lot of industries. It's not just libraries, okay? Let's talk about COHA's development process and how they work. Um, there are 211 developers who've had a patch committed to COHA as of the 17th of May. 9% of those are women. One has a patch both as a man and a woman. That would be me. Um, and, and yeah, she's pretty odd. It's all written in Perl except for some JavaScript. We used to use UI. We've thrown that overboard. We're now gradually integrating to Bootstrap. People seem to like it better. There's a lot of jQuery involved, but that's mostly interface hackery. Oh, there we go. Edit twice. Six-month release cycle. We re-elect the entire release team every six months, which sounds mad, and it is, but it, it works. Somebody can be re-elected if they want to. And we elect a release maintainer for each of the two previous releases. The one that just came out, May 22nd, has a release maintainer. The one that came out six months ago has a maintainer. The one that will come out five and a half months from now has a new release manager. How do we patch this thing? It's a globally used application. The standards for bibliographic data are not the same around the world. We need it in multiple languages around the world. Some places need it multiple languages in their own library. So it's a vast product. Hmm? No. Mark, mar now, the ISO 80-something standard that Mark uses for its transmission form is standard globally. However, what fields mean what are not the same globally. Um, 
There are two extant standards that are pretty large, Unimark in most of the world that is a Unicode, fully Unicode compliant, and Mark 21, which is the US Canadian kind of standard. Um, there are some variants, Germany and Norway both have variant Mark standards as well. So yeah, it, it gets complex. Let's talk about the patch process, how we patch this thing. Well, we start with Bugzilla. We required, beginning about a year ago, that all patches shall have a Bugzilla entry. Well, if you like Bugzilla, that's fine. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter which tool you use, as long as every patch needs to be referred to here. Somebody writes a patch. We use Git BZ because we use Git for version control. And so Git Bugzilla is a really nice tool for handing things back and forth between Git and Bugzilla. Once you've written a patch, you say Git BZ commit, and it hands it, puts it, attaches it to the bug. You have to get sign off from somebody else. That somebody else can't work for the same company or library that you do. Most of the time. There are rare exceptions. The QA manager, which is an elected position, and the QA assistants will then look for integration issues. They will check for adherence to the coding standards. More about that in a minute. Um, and they'll also put eyeballs on it and test it to see if it actually works. And they will flunk patches, you know, for no testing plan. They will flunk patches for um, you didn't comment this, and you probably should. They will flunk patches for why did you indent with three spaces, you knucklehead. Um, then the release manager or the release maintainer will integrate and push. If that sounds draconian, there's a reason for that. We've had loose cannons who had commit bits before. It's bad. Yeah. So, so this is, you know, it seems a little draconian to some people in the community, and, and there are bottlenecks. The QAM is a big bottleneck. Yes, 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 it happens. And, and if she's watching the live stream, which I think she probably is, she's probably logging on to IRC right now and writing vile things about me for saying evil things about her. I'm not, Katrine, really, I'm not. <laughs> okay. The nature of the development patch of our development process is that, like a lot of open source projects, relatively few people are actually paid to do this. There's, you know, half a dozen big companies around the, around the world that are doing this kind of thing, and they all pay one or two or three or four developers to do this, and a huge percentage of the patches come from those sources. And there's this great long tail of people who have put in one or two or three or ten patches. And the non-paid developers are often library users, not regular Perl developers, who are trying to solve a problem that frustrates them in their day-to-day -day workings. This bugs me, so I'm going to fix it. And if they're not competent to do that, well, some of them fix it anyway, whether they're competent to or not. And some of them will sponsor the development and pay somebody who is. But either way, that patch is originating from somebody who's not routinely considered a developer. And that's led to some decisions in the co-op community. The co-op community has decided that that long tail is worth having. That's one of the beauties of open source. Uh, Clay Shirky did a presentation at TED a few years ago about the long tail of open source projects and how valuable that is. And, and the co-op community has really decided that's worth having. Um, and the coding practices and standards, therefore, have to reflect that. We need lower barriers to entry. We don't need every developer to be as sharp as Matt Trout, or as obscene as Matt Trout, or wait, never mind. Can you imagine 50 developers all bellowing at each other in maddish, never mind. That's a scary thought, isn't it? So here's a little bit of our coding guidelines. Please, hardcore developers, try not to throw up on the floor. Our emphasis on readability. A whole lot of our guidelines have to do with spacing, variable names. Make sure you use modern colon colon pearl. Thank you. Yay, modern pearl. Can, can I ask you, is yeah. there like a coding standard that everyone has access to? Yes, it's on a wiki. Okay. It's on the wiki. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a link into the call community here in a little bit. Um, we don't use objects. Heresy! It's not object oriented. No, it's very procedural. The only thing we have that kind of look like objects, which are really just hashes, are real world things. Books, branches, people. Users. Because librarians, if you talk about a class, if you talk about a class constructor. A class constructor for a book, I'm sorry, is a publishing house. They're used to that. 
If you talk about that as a piece of software, they're going to give you the blank thousand yard stare. And rightly so, that's not their job. Koha is coded around that concept that even a librarian who is not a coder can stick their fingers in the code and make some sense out of it. So there's very slow movement toward object oriented. And yes, it's moose. There's a little bit of moosey stuff happening now, sort of. But it's real low level stuff. Here's some more horrors for you. Um, tests just became mandatory last year. And now only in the core namespaces. And the rest of our testing was done by, you know, spin it up and try. And see if it does what you think it does. Which, yes, is a very tedious way to do testing and it doesn't work very well in the long run, especially on a multilingual, multi-platform, multiple coding standards system. It really gets complex. Most idioms in Perl that are kind of commonplace among hardcore developers just don't happen in Perl. The ternary if operator, maybe a half a dozen times in 30,000 lines of code. Maybe a half dozen times. Postfix if and unless, no, mm -mm. they just don't do that. Now, having read Perl best practices, I, I, I don't care for postfix if and unless myself. And I don't care for unless at all. But that's just a readability thing, that's a preference thing. But those idioms just don't happen in our code very much because it is a barrier to entry for a new developer to see those idioms. Now, you might be tempted, and, and Matt's not here so I can talk about him, people who are go-getters, energetic, who never sleep, might be tempted to go in and say, God, I could make that so much more efficient and I haven't even looked at the code yet, and I could make that so much better. Don't. Okay? The Perl community neither wants nor needs people who can fix it by someone who knows better, even if you do. And I admit some of you probably do. That's fine. There was a guy who came in a while back and he really, really, really urged people, we need database independence, we need DivX class. He was shunned. Because the first thing he brought was, you need to change everything you've been doing for a decade not a patch. You want to talk change, bring a patch. Patches change stuff, not talk. And that's how the community is there. And they're very, they're very slow to, to adopt object oriented things for the same reason, because it's change and change happens slowly and you haven't had anybody who's really championed that in a positive way. Okay? Rewriting, well yes, Koha does need a complete rewrite. There are bits of it that are just insane madness, uh, it, it's, not, it's not mark independent. I would like to see it able to accept XML data or uh, mods or mets or some of the other formats, but no. The idea of using Catalyst and rewriting all of that or using Dancer and rewriting all that has been floated. No, gets no traction whatsoever. <laughs> Sisyphus rolling up a hill, you can do that, but you will get rolled over and then you'll be back at the bottom of the hill again. Try again. Is Koha a duocracy or a meritocracy? Now, Sharon talked about this last year in his keynote about meritocracies, and there really aren't any. They're aristocracies. And, and Koha is an aristocracy, absolutely. Um, it's not even close to a duocracy. However, that said, if you want to get into the ocracy and the leadership, you better do something. Doing nothing is worth that much. It's worth what you put in it. And if all you put in it is talk, that's all you're going to get. Our semi-benevolent dictator is Chris Cormack, the original author of Koha. He's from New Zealand. Um, he's about this tall and half Maori and um, can be quite intimidating when irked. And he remembers very well the things that irk him. And he forgives, but he doesn't forget. And if you mess with his trust, it takes a long, long time to get it back. Okay. There's a lot of people like that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But even when he's not the release manager, he has a lot of pull. Okay? So if you want to get involved in Koha, coming in and chattering on the channel on the Koha RC is no good whatsoever. Don't start with that. Other than asking questions and trying to, hey, I really want to get involved. I think this is really cool. And how can I help? And then, that's great. But to come in and say, oh, we need to fix class. We need this. We need that. No, no good. Get a few patches in. Hey, there's a huge Bugzilla database, plenty of patches. You can make your learning that way, whatever works. Get on Chris's good side, 
be submitting some good stuff that gets him interested in what you're talking about. Then you can get somewhere. Have I scared you yet? Um, the community has a process for discussion of big stuff. They have monthly IRC meetings. Anybody's welcome. Show up. Anybody may vote, even on big things. Um, but the process is somewhat glacial. Get used to it. Have I, have I frightened you yet? Koha-community.org is the Koha community's home. There is a Koha.org that has been usurped by Fork. We don't like them very much. Call to action, which seems kind of strange because I've been telling you don't, 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 right? So it's kind of a call to inaction, and I'll finish quickly and we're done. Know the, and, and, and here we step away from just Koha or just Pearl or just whatever community you're in. Know the communities you are in. It's more than just code. It is human beings. Even the ones you haven't met because they live on the far side of the planet. My best friend on the planet is somebody I've never met face to face. But I'm going to this October because she's coming to a conference. Right? She's in Germany. And yeah, I hope she's watching. But know the communities, know the people, get to know them, talk to them, ask them questions, ask them what drives them, why they do this, why are they involved in Koha? Because I'm helping my library, or because I'm helping the library that honest to God, my mom works at, in one case, know the community. All of them are a little different. What works in one may or may not work in another, and that's okay. We were told last year that the Apache Software Foundation was a really good way to run a software community. Is there a really good way to run the Pearl community? I don't know. I'm not qualified to make that call. None of us is. None of us is. Know that the communities are products of history that you may or may not know. Ask the people that are knowledgeable, why is this so? And know that there is no wrong way. There are some ways that you may see as less productive. Some ways that that doesn't make any sense. But it goes back to that history thing. You weren't there. Ten years from now, we'll be saying, oh, you weren't at Yap CNA 2012 when all this hullabaloo went down. You and I will be talking about it over beer and going, oh, you know, these youngsters, they don't know what we went through. Right? This stuff passes. Observe, learn, and ask questions. That's the call to action. Not code. Do that later. Because the people are far more interesting in the first place. The code is cool. The people are amazing. I hope this has helped you. I hope you can find something in there that you can take back to the communities that you're a part of, whether they are corporate, your churches, your civic organizations, your software communities, because this applies everywhere.